than I told the G7 members um, very pointedly that the G7 has a debt to GDP of 124. That means they have more debt than their GDP. And historically, it used to be considered something safe around 50% of GDP. Another little factoid about America. In, 19, in 2000, our U.S. deficit was $8 trillion. So 223 years of building a deficit of $8 trillion. From, 19, from 2000 then to 2023, we added $23 trillion of deficits. We are... You know, we are now breaking through 100% of debt to GDP as a nation. Just imagine, you are standing on the edge of a cliff, peering down into the vast abyss. The wind whips around you and the ground feels unsteady beneath your feet. You know that one wrong step could send you plunging into the darkness below. This is the precarious position Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock, believes many investors are in right now. But the real danger is not what you might think. It is not the volatile markets, the inflationary pressures, or even the geopolitical tensions that have everyone on the edge. According to Larry Fink, there is a hidden threat, one that could crush your portfolio if you're not prepared. And he's got a plan to safeguard his investments against it. How? Let's get started. The CBO has just estimated that our deficits, I think over the next 10 years, are going to go to $50 trillion. This is not funny money. This is a serious, serious problem. Larry Fink raises significant concerns about the economic health of the G7 nations, particularly regarding the mounting levels of debt and the lack of focus on growth. He begins by pointing out a startling fact. The G7 countries, which include the world's largest economies, now hold 60% of global debt, contribute to 40% of global GDP, and account for only 10% of the world's population. This imbalance is a major cause for concern, as it highlights the disproportionate burden of debt these countries carry relative to their economic output and population size. Fink is particularly worried about the lack of discourse on deficit and growth in the US and other G7 economies. He notes that discussions around how to foster economic growth are largely absent from public and political dialogues, even during significant events and policy discussions. This omission, according to Fink, is troubling because without a clear focus on growth, these economies are headed for serious trouble. To illustrate his point, Fink shared his concerns about their collective debt to GDP ratio, which stands at 124%. This means that G7 nations have more debt than their entire economic output, a situation that historically was considered safe only at levels around 50% of GDP. The US itself has seen its debt balloon dramatically in recent years. Fink points out that in the year 2000, the US deficit was $8 trillion, a figure that took 223 years to accumulate. However, from 2000 to 2023, the US added $23 trillion in deficits, pushing the nation's debt to GDP ratio over 100%, meaning the country owes more than it produces in a year. This rapid increase in debt coupled with a lack of corresponding growth, is a red flag that Fink says we can't afford to ignore. What's more, the Congressional Budget Office CBO, projects that the US deficits could reach a staggering $50 trillion over the next decade. Fink stresses that it isn't just abstract or funny money, it's a real problem that could have severe consequences. He cautions that if global capital markets become more developed and competitive, the US might struggle to attract the international capital it relies on to finance its deficits. Currently, the US depends on 40% of international capital to fund its deficits, a reliance that Fink believes is risky and unsustainable in the long term. Moreover, Fink contrasts the US situation with that of other G7 countries like Italy and Japan. Both of these nations have even worse debt-to-GDP ratios, over 200%. Yet, they aren't as dependent on foreign capital as the US. And why? Because their citizens have high savings rate, driven by fear and uncertainty about the future. Instead of spending or investing in the economy, people are hoarding money in their bank accounts. This creates a paradox. 
Despite their higher debt levels, Italy and Japan can still finance their deficits domestically, while the US relies heavily on foreign capital. This reliance on international capital is a double-edged sword. While it has allowed the US to finance its deficits and recover more quickly from economic downturns like the Great Recession, it also makes the country vulnerable to shifts in global capital markets. If other markets like those in India, Saudi Arabia or Japan continue to develop and become more attractive destinations for capital, the US could find itself in a precarious position. The United States is dependent on 40% of international capital to finance our deficits. And we are treating it like we're going to have this luxury forever. I hope we do. I think it's kind of wrong to think that. I believe in America more than any other country as I travel around the world. I see more opportunity to put more capital in the United States over the next five years than any place in the world. So I'm not fearful this is going to be a problem in the next five years, but it could be a real problem for somebody who has seven grandchildren. And I really am very worried about what does that mean? Fink believes that over the next five years, the US will continue to attract significant capital and remain a strong investment destination. However, he is deeply concerned about the long-term implications of current trajectory, particularly for the future generations. As someone with seven grandchildren, Fink worries about the legacy of debt and economic challenges that the current generation is leaving behind. He calls for a renewed focus on growth and a pragmatic policy to address these issues before they become insurmountable problems. So what does Fink propose as a solution? We have to have a growth agenda. And the only way I know we're going to have a growth agenda is to rebuild our economies and infrastructure and digitization, decarbonization of rebuilding our infrastructure so we can increase productivity. I mean, the key for any economy, elevate productivity. And I do believe if you overlie what the potential of AI, if you overlay the potential of AI and how that's going to change uh, robotics. Larry Fink stresses the urgent need for a growth-oriented agenda to rebuild economies through infrastructure modernization, digitization, and decarbonization. He emphasizes that increasing productivity is crucial for economic growth, particularly in countries with declining populations. Fink believes that advancements in AI and robotics will play a vital role in enhancing productivity, especially for nations facing demographic challenges. As populations decline, economic activity slows and deficits rise, making it imperative to find alternative ways to stimulate growth. But this AI transition will require substantial investments in infrastructure and energy, particularly in states with favorable permitting processes and access to renewable or dispatchable energy sources like natural gas. Fink is optimistic about the potential for private capital to drive this transformation. He points out that there are trillions of dollars of private investment ready to be deployed in decarbonization and digitization projects. However, he stresses the importance of pragmatism in government policy, particularly in speeding up the permitting process for infrastructure projects. Without a more pragmatic approach, he warns the pace of progress could be too slow to capitalize on the opportunities presented by AI and other emerging technologies. One of Fink's key observations is the geographic disparity in where new jobs and investments are being created, particularly in the context of the Inflation Reduction Act (IRA). He notes that although the majority of the IRA's federal funding came from blue states, the majority of the projects it has funded are located in the red states. This is largely due to the faster permitting processes in those states, which have enabled them to attract more investments in renewable energy and other infrastructure projects. Fink believes that states with efficient permitting processes and abundant energy resources like Texas and Pennsylvania will be at the forefront of the AI-driven economic transformation. If you, if you focus on the need to grow our economy, we're going to have to grow our economy um, through greater productivity. And uh, technology is the engine of increased productivity. And we are an economy, and I'm sure Mary's going to talk about it. I mean, we've had a t technological boom for 20 years, and yet we're sitting with a, a sub-4% unemployment rate. 
Um, and so technology does change jobs, but over time it creates new jobs. And the problem is that transition, and also there's geographic differences too, so how do you blend that and balance that out? And so I, I look at all the benefits that technology could be, and there's no question in my mind, the bad players are gonna be able to use AI to, to increase the volume of bad information, misinformation. Um, there's no question about it. And so now that, what that means is the need of technology to decipher what is good information and bad information is just so much more need of power. Larry acknowledges that while technology can disrupt jobs, it ultimately creates new opportunities over time. The challenge lies in managing the transition and addressing geographic disparities. Fink also highlights the growing issue of misinformation, noting that AI can be misused by bad actors to spread false information. This increases the demand for technology capable of distinguishing between good and bad information, which in turn requires more power, underscoring the importance of advancing infrastructure to support this need. So Fink emphasizes the exponential increase in power demand driven by the rise of AI technology. He points out that AI searches require significantly more energy than traditional, Google than traditional Google searches due to the need for greater accuracy and the filtering of vast amounts of data. As AI becomes more integrated into our daily life, the demand for reliable and abundant power will only grow, creating significant opportunities for infrastructure development, particularly in data centers and power sources. Despite the challenges, Fink sees a unique advantage for the United States in this evolving landscape. The country has access to cheap energy, vast land for renewable energy sources like wind and solar, and the technological capabilities to meet these demands. In contrast, regions like Europe face challenges due to the lack of domestic power sources, making them more dependent on external energy supplies, such as those from the Middle East, this reliance could shift global power dynamics, with energy-rich regions gaining increased influence. Fink also warns of the urgent need to upgrade the U.S. power grid to support this growing demand. He notes that while the U.S. has enjoyed excess power for the past two decades, the increasing energy requirements of AI and other technologies could strain the grid if not addressed. States with existing power infrastructure will likely emerge as big winners in this new era benefiting from public-private partnerships and infrastructure investments. It really reshape America in very vast ways, but um, we, we need to be addressing this now, and, and if we do, this is a great opportunity for our children or grandchildren to have great jobs, great future, and I truly do believe if we, if we put the trillions of dollars to work, we're going to grow out of our problem, and not, we won't be as worried about the deficits. Fink views this transition as a tremendous opportunity for the U.S., to lead in AI development, create jobs, and drive economic growth. But he stresses the importance of pragmatic government policies to support this growth and ensure that the nation capitalizes on its advantages. If managed properly, this shift could secure a prosperous future for generations to come. But if ignored, the consequences could be dire, not just for the economy, but for the investors who aren't prepared for the changes ahead. So. As you stand at the edge of that cliff, ask yourself, are you ready for what's coming? Larry Fink has already made his move. Will you?